So today we'll be talking again about what is a traumatic brain injury, meeting the unique service needs of people with traumatic brain injury, assistive technology for brain injury, and the BISCA or TBI service sites in California. What is a TBI? A TBI is any injury to the brain caused by an external mechanical force. Um, so how does this happen? Well, there's a variety of ways. The most common causes are motor vehicle accidents. Um, let me start by saying that uh, some of the causes in uh, some of the most common age ranges for TBI are youth, very small children, uh, as well as your teenagers to adolescents and the elderly. Uh, Doug, really quickly, this um, is Kim, the presentation. Motor vehicle, ac motor vehicle accidents um, are one major cause of a traumatic brain injury. This is in this is a leading cause of death and TBI amongst teens and youth and young adults uh, due to learning how to drive, distracted driving, and driving under the influence. Another common cause of uh, brain injury is uh, assaults, whether it's fistfights, child abuse, or other types of violence. Um, their slips and falls are, uh, and blows to the head are another common cause of TBI. This is especially common with young children learning to walk, youth who skate, skateboard, bike, or climbing, and, and the elderly uh, from, again, uh, slipping and falling or falling downstairs, uh, having uh, balance issues. These are also some of the common, um, these are also common in sports accidents. Um, you've heard probably a lot in the media recently about sports injuries and the fact that they're really doing more work to be able to get people um, to be diagnosed more quickly, kept out of the game if they're, if they have a concussion, um, both in the sports on a like uh, national football and that sort of thing, but also on the more local level, your high school games and that sort of thing. Uh, they're actually coming up with legislation this year that, um, if passed, will uh, make it so that there are more restrictions on um, just letting somebody go right back into the game if they've had a concussion. And I use the word concussion, and that is um, the same as a traumatic brain injury. When someone has a TBI, they've had a concussion. Um, it's also commonly associated with shaken baby syndrome uh, and then blast injuries. The shock waves caused, um, cause a shaking from the impact of an explosive device. The shock waves, heat, and shrapnel from explosions and blasts are a leading cause of TBI for people who have served in the military. The majority of soldiers fighting in the current wars are between 18 and 25 years old. Our returning soldiers and veterans are often seeking assistance from community partners such as independent living centers because of the desire to uh, have confidentiality and because of the long waiting periods that are often uh, the case with people getting services through the VA as well as um, possibly having to commute a long distance for services through the VA. Um, so let me go on to the next slide. How to screen for a TBI. Um, TBI is often called the hidden disability. There are an estimated 350,000 TBIs in California each year. 
often a person sustains a TBI and doesn't even know that they've had one. As a person working on providing AT, it is helpful to know the signs of TBI since it may not have been diagnosed. A neurologist or neurosurgeon, excuse me, a neurologist or neuropsychologist is the professional who is most likely to determine medically if someone has a TBI. It is important to know if someone may have a TBI when considering assistive technology because the type of accommodation may change. It can give you a heads up in terms of uh, related needs to look for. It may be that if they have a certain series of symptoms that make you think they might have a traumatic brain injury, they may also have other symptoms that are common with a TBI. So it can help you as a professional in knowing how to work with the consumer. So how to screen for a TBI. Um, ways of finding out are finding out if the person was in the military and injured while they were in the service. Um, have you ever had an injury that resulted in the following? Being dazed, confused, or seeing stars? Not remembering the injury? Loss of memory of the event? Right events right before or after the injury. This is like a short-term amnesia. Losing consciousness. Having headaches. Strong headaches are very common with TBI. And one way of determining it is that they didn't have the headaches before they had the accident or injury. Dizziness or irritability. Every TBI is different, though, so the person doesn't need to have all of these symptoms to have had a TBI. Sometimes there isn't an actual loss of consciousness, but instead the person felt disoriented or, at a, or saw stars. Okay, next we're going to skip to Crystal's slide. Um, Crystal will talk about the long-term cognitive effects of a TBI and then we'll do brainstorming um, for AT for these cognitive, cognitive effects. Crystal. Hello, can everyone hear me? All right, so we're doing the cognitive effects as well as the, we will uh, then be going over the physical, sensory, and behavioral. So. Um, but with the cognitive effects, you see here that with TBI, there's often uh, there's often um, effects with attention, concentration, processing speed. So many people who say that who've had a TBI say they don't process information as quickly as they used to. Memory is a big issue. Uh, planning, problem solving, completing tasks, and organizational skills. And um, these are very common among people with TBI, mostly because a lot of the um, brain injuries affect the frontal lobe or where your forehead is. And many of the brain injuries, whether it's a slip or fall or something, or affect that part of the brain and that part of the brain is in charge of your executive functions that functioning that allow you to do the planning and is where you store your memory and different things like that. So this is a big place where um, folks with TBI um, benefit from having AT that um, support them with their cognitive abilities. So next we wanted to, before we go into some of our strategies, we wanted to brainstorm with you all um, on AT for cognitive effects, and we were wanting to have you uh, type in what um, what AT you've worked with with folks um, or strategies related to memory or processing um, or organization. Um, if you guys would like to put in your in, in the chat feature, um, we will then be putting that on the screen. Um, thank you.
Okay. 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 Somebody wrote down the PDA organizer. Good. On an iPad. Thank you, Scott. Oh, you have to. Toodle do. Okay. Pocket informant. Google Voice with smartphone to keep focused and organized. Um, AbleNet communication suite. Dragon dictation. Shift cuff switches. Screen readers. Evernote. Uh, notebook and pen. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Okay. So I'll let Crystal take over from here. Thank you so much. Um, those are really great, uh, and with the I, with the different applications on phones, that's an, uh, always a good one as well. Um, some additional things with a lot of those are reminder devices. Those are really great for our, um, our con TBI consumers. Um, some of the issues that um, with the memory. Well, they tend to work with three types of memory. The, our long-term memory, which is being able to uh, to have memories of knowledge from the past, um, folks with TBI tend to have this intact. And so when, when they have short-term memory issues, most people don't believe it all the time. Um, but this episodic memory or the working memory um, is often impaired because it's saved in a different part of your brain than the long-term memory. And then another place, um, a type of memory is the sensory memory or the ability to And the short-term memory uh, uh, or the sensory memory to, um, with the consumer's ability to navigate the environment is also something that affects many of our consumers um, as far as being able to figure out how to get your, to your appointments and different things. Um, so some strategies for working with memory in addition to what you guys have also mentioned, so thank you for that, was um, is to have a consumer use a planner to be able to um, remember what they needed to do for the day and to establish routines um, with making sure they reference it um, in the morning, the first thing every morning and in the evening as well and to be able to track it. Um, because often what happens is uh, if they do not see the ne the task that they need to do the day before, it's a blank slate and it doesn't get done. So the the planners are uh, whatever form works best for the consumer is always a really great way to go um, in developing that routine, as well as um, using the prosthetic memory aids. So just like a prosthetic leg. Uh, PDAs, uh, cell phones, um, peach, uh, paper and pencil, uh, whatever works for that consumer. Um, another uh, great thing to use with memory is to have the consumer use recording devices, um, either for their appointments they have with you um, when you're going over different assistive technology with them. One thing. Um, to remember is that even though they might have other uh, other things that they're getting help for, um, if 
it's unique to them with the memory that you might have to uh, keep that in mind when working with them on other AT issues that they're needing to work with you with. Um, we also have strategies for the tension organizing strategies because um, of the nature of brain injuries, um, folks uh, often uh, don't have the filter to uh, filter out noises or distractions like other folks do. And so in order to help them um, concentrate, it's really important to dec decrease those distractions and to find to schedule activities um, at, at an appropriate time when they're most likely to be able to remember um, and breaking down tasks into smaller steps so that they can follow along versus losing their place and not knowing where they need to be. Um, and this includes making a plan um, that considers the task completion time um, and the importance of each task and be, being able to prioritize those things, which um, and when it comes to helping them in the workplace, this might um, it might be helpful to have them also plan for uninterrupted work time, since many of you work with folks who have vocational needs as well. Um, next, uh, so these are just some of the um, memory devices that are used and uh, either being a planner, there's also the tap memo that allows you to leave a, um, uh, leave a message to remind folks uh, um, later on what, what they need to get done. Medication reminders, many folks with uh, TBI um, have different medications that they're on either for um, seizure disorders or different things that's very important that they um, remember to take but due to their disability sometimes for many forget so that allows them to take that regularly as well as other electronic devices including phones or whatever they have and really making um, being creative with what they have um, either apps on the phones or what have you um, because many um, do have trouble with vocational um, goals and don't have too much money. So it's a lot of the other strategies we have are low cost because of the um, nature of um, economics, especially in these times. So next we have uh, the long-term physical effects and Douglas going to go into that for us. Okay, thank you, Crystal. Okay, thank you, Crystal. Yes, next I want to yes. talk next about the long-term physical effects long of having a traumatic brain injury. Um, um, excuse me, I'm on the wrong slide. Okay, um, okay. Um, fatigue, fatigue. Uh, it's one of the major things that happens that in traumatic brain injury. Injury. Um, um, Many of the physical ex effects are similar to those of disability, other disabilities, but sometimes they're slightly different or combined. These disabilities can be due to other simultaneous injuries that occur at the same time as the traumatic brain injury or it can be due to the brain affecting a particular region of the body. So the different areas that I'm mentioning are fatigue, headaches are very common, problems with coordination, balance, um, poor fine motor coordination, one-sided limb weakness, reduced motor speed, Spatial disorientation. So, I'd like to skip on to the next slide here. Yes, okay. 
<laughs> that. Okay, got it. Um, so, I'd like to do what we did last time and kind of talk about these effects and come up with possible suggestions for AT that might help um, with fatigue. So, um, oh, I saw one that's on there now from the last one that we did. The Intel reader was the uh, cognitive. Thank you for adding that. Um, excuse me. So I said for T, what are, what are some of the types of um, AT that would be helpful when the kinds of physical disabilities that we talked about? Headaches, fatigue, coordination, balance, uh, motor skills, um, reduced motor speed, spatial disorientation. If you could please type into the box there any suggestions you have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, can we talk a little bit about the reasons for the physical effects? Um, the a brain injury is often caused by shearing of the brain. Uh, there's actually ridges inside of the brain, and when you were in an accident. Your head often has what's called a coup, contra coup effect, where you, your brain moves forward inside of this, uh, it's like a, inside of fluid, and it hits against the front of, your, uh, of the inside of your skull, and then again in the back of your skull. And the, the ridges on the inside causes shearing of your brain. And so um, that's what causes a lot of the uh, difficulties with motor skills. Because that whatever part of the brain is in, in charge of those motor skills uh, is being affected. So let me move on to some of the things that we've come up with, and that is uh, with fatigue. I wanted to mention that um, making important decisions when the person has the greatest amount of mental, uh, mental energy, uh, this is usually in the morning. That's a good accommodation. So making sure that what you're doing uh, is this, this most difficult gets done during your best time. It's not always in the morning. Some people are night people, and you know they work best at midnight or two in the morning. But in general, the morning works for people as the best time. And so when you're thinking of making an appointment with a consumer, uh, think about what is their best time of day. Help work with them to come up with the best time of day in order to um, have them not be fatigued. Schedule appointments uh, in the um, in the morning or at whatever time is best for them. Make as many activities as possible into a routine to maximize choice. This saves mental energy. Um, so once it just becomes a part of their regular routine, it no longer is as fatiguing. Do not fill up the brain injured consumer's day with scheduled activities. You need to realize that things are probably going to take longer, and there's going to need to be breaks, maybe even naps during the day uh, to break up their schedule. Um, do one important thing a day. Don't think that you're going to get everything done to conquer the world in one day. Uh, so you may just find that you can only do one activity a day that, that's significant. Uh, and again, like I said, every TBI is different. This is, this is for somebody that's got a fairly severe TBI. Other people may function at a rate where they can do more than that. Um, so again, this is just kind of a rule of thumb, but it really varies for each individual. So now let me talk about some of the physical aids. 
Um, the person that's having problems with balance may need a cane, crutches, or a wheelchair. Um, there's also the potential need for someone to have a uh, use a hearing aid. Um, they may be specialized beds, specialized chairs. Um, if you're dealing with somebody to help get them ready for work, there may be workstation accommodations, uh, ways of setting up their desk and tables to uh, work well with them. Um, there could be feeding devices to assist in being able to eat, and also dressing aids. I see somebody mentioned a comment here. Uh, motorized wheelchairs and walkers. Yes, thank you. Okay, so let me move ahead here. So here's some pictures of some of the mobility uh, things that we talked about. There's some variety of canes, a uh, wheelchair, and some pictures of possible ways of accommodating the workstation. And that is to put this being closer to the person. Um, and that may be helpful. There may be things with contrasting colors that they need to be looking at. Um, so um, basically set up the, the workstation, whether it's at work or at home, to be able to uh, fit the person as best as possible. Um, next, Crystal is going to talk about the long-term sensory effects. Okay, so um, so with the long-term sensory effects, uh, <coughs> what you'll notice with um, with traumatic brain injury is uh, is it can cause many of similar. Um, effects as in other disabilities with some of the unique things with uh, but also be very unique. So with hearing loss, um, some many who let's say have a brain injury on one side of the their brain, it will affect the, their opposite ear and they might lose complete hearing on one side of um, on their left side if they hurt the right side of their brain. Many also have, uh, I always say this wrong, tinnitus, no, yeah, <laughs> um, you know what I mean. So, and audio processing, so with the hearing, um, it also affects how information is processed. With the visual uh, change, once again, there could be loss in one eye, as well as double vision, um, depending on whether the uh, um, that part of the brain was disturbed. Loss of visual field, and what that means is, for instance, back to the person who injured the right side of the brain, they would have what they call left neglect or right neglect, where they can't see anything uh, peripherally on one side of, um, of the brain, or sometimes it's both. And once again, visual processing um, can, be, uh, can also be affected on how they process information visually. Hypersensitivity to all sensory input. So what uh, that would also include is being very sensitive to light, to noises, to anything that's just overloading, uh, overloading them because once again, that filter that they had before is often damaged, so they can't uh, um, filter that information out, and as well as loss of taste and smell, and numbness uh, is another sensory effect that many uh, many can have. Um, once again, we're going to do another quick brainstorm before I go into some of the sensory uh, strategies that we have. So I want to take another quick moment to have you guys um, brainstorm in the chat box on a assistive technology for these 
sensory um, for the sensory effects. If you can just put that in the chat box, that would be fantastic. And later on, we'll be putting all these lists together so that we can build off these lists as well. Okay. So then, um, again, if we can think of something for the sensory effects. Um, the the hearing loss, um, the visual system changes, the hypersensitivity to all sensory input, maybe some types of AT for um, numbness or loss of smell or taste. Um, feel free to write in your chat box uh, any ideas that you have for this. We'll wait just another minute to allow people a chance to write in the chat box for ideas for sensory effects. Thank you for processing. Okay, let's see if we have somebody's input. It says one of my colleagues wants to know if anyone has recommendations for word prediction software to support typing, um, something that's not voice recognition oriented. Does anybody want to field that question? OK, lots of iPad apps with WTRED, WTV, another person put word Q. Um, somebody mentioned email. Um, okay, Eric said uh, for sensory changes, eye patches, uh, specialized glasses. Uh, thank you for mentioning that about the specialized glasses, because indeed it really makes a difference when somebody is getting a prescription for glasses to know that they have a TBI or might have a TBI because it really requires specialized glasses. Uh, that are affecting processing rather than just uh, the focal, focal distance. Uh, smoke alarms in case of sense of smell or loss. Smell is lost. Okay. Um, let's see. Here's another one. Uh, word processing changes. Uh, changing the background, the fonts, etc. Um, yeah, that can make a big difference. The color contrast um, and different people have different kinds of colors that work for them. Um, common ones that work real well are um, having a, a background that's like a very light blue. Um, but other, other soft colors as a, as a background can work well. Um, but, black and, but black and white works really well. So it's really personalized to who the person is and what works best for them. OK. Well, good. That is some good input. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So back to uh, so some of the strategies for sensory with the verbal and auditory um, effects of a brain injury um, include suggesting that the consumer uh, 
asked to repeat information and to slow down the rate of speech um, to allow for um, information to be better processed. Um, having the consumer paraphrase information to make sure that they understand and to reinforce that information Encur encourage um, them to ask clarifying questions and using a recording device or taking notes um, can also be helpful um, with the verbal um, with the visual um, having visual aids that account for the double vision and field of vision, um, talking electronic devices, which a lot of devices do now, single word scanners, which uh, can read the sentences for them, um, which can also be very helpful, especially if someone has double vision or different visual needs. Um, E-books have been a wonderful thing for people with visual, as many of you know, um, so that they can enjoy um, uh, reading, or if their students are in, in the, um, they can still keep along with their, their work there. Having text and screen readers, the reading pens again, uh, bigger print size and fonts and space, Word prediction software is also uh, very helpful because many um, many have trouble coming up with it, what they're about to say, and having those blank spaces. And portable talking uh, spell checkers, dictionaries, and the sources are very helpful for this. Um, some AT that is helpful. Um, many know with Kurzweil, um, with reading the information for them, or or software like the Dragon Natural Speaking um, that would help them uh, get the information out onto the page, as well as as the the transparency that change the color of the page um, without having to print it out every time. Um, and once again, there's many different colors that are specific to people's um, specific needs. Um, now I want to go into um, the emotional and behavioral effects of a TBI, and this is what can sometimes make uh, m make it unique with working with folks with TBI is the behavioral and many can get easily overwhelmed, impulsive, um, and be socially inappropriate because once again, um, that filter that was affected that affects uh, the executive functioning also affects your fo social functioning. So many are are unaware of these deficits, even though they may have them. And that is not because of denial per se, but the part that really makes that click is, is something that was also affected with the injury. Um, and many have uh, showed difficulty controlling emotions or having the, the emotional outburst. And so in a meeting with them, they might start crying um, or laughing or so anger um, in outbursts, and it might be a shock to uh, uh, figure out what to do with a consumer who is showing those uh, um, those characteristics. But mm, those characteristics come from the consumer uh, being overwhelmed um, rather than having uh, being part of their personality. And so one thing to help with that is to avoid overwhelming or giving too much information. And those, um, those reactions are called a catastrophic reaction. So the, the anger outburst, the tears, the flight, wanting to avoid the situation, um, freezing, not just going a complete mental block, confusion or uncontrollable laughter are, are the six. 
um, catastrophic reactions many people with TBI display. Usually they tend to do one or, one or two. Um, one thing to have that consumer do um, to work with them is to say, uh, to have them do some self-talk that I, for instance, I am angry, so I must be overloaded, and to simplify, avoid, and delay. And if you do that with them, they often, um, those different reactions usually dissipate very quickly. Another thing that comes up for consumers with TBI is um, a phenomenon called, um, that is known as gumballing, and that's not a scientific term, but um, wh what that implies is thoughts that pop into someone's head without that filter pops out their mouth, with, and um, there's a lot of loss of private thought. And so to make sure, um, one, not to have a little bit of a thicker coat because uh, they can't always control exactly what is said. So to be able to work with them on what's a private versus a public thought um, by using a five second rule to in place of the filter that usually um, would be in place. And otherwise they can be perceived as rude, inconsiderate, or impulsive when really um, they're working through their disability that um, that has makes that harder for them. Um, so going in to that, these are a couple more suggestions on meeting with a consumer with TBI uh, because many of you would be showing them a new um, skill with using, if, for instance, if you were teaching them how to use the curse while would need to train them on on the different technologies, so to demonstrate the task, state the instructions, and to provide simple um, examples and minimize confusion, so the avoiding the figurative language or the jargon or the geek speak um, to be able to. Uh, um, just simplify the the instructions and to provide the verbal and written instructions to reinforce the information and um, and back to reinforcing many people with TBI need that repeated uh, repeated instructions so um, to teach them how to use assistive technology or even the strategies we've mentioned so you might have to meet with them several times um, and other things that uh, help I've gone over making sure to have um, to reduce how fast you're giving that information um, and maybe splitting the the training over a longer period of time just to do one task at a time and to schedule longer appointments so that you can don't feel rushed and not speaking quickly, as well as my favorite is making the reminder calls for appointments uh, or tasks. And why this is important back to the memory is many of them uh, um, will forget to go to your appointment, but not because they don't want to be there, but because um, of the, the nature of their disability, and this is the point where many of them um, will miss an appointment and then lose services, but it, by making that simple call, it allows um, them to have the chance to come to, the, to their appointment, so it just takes a second. Um, when, when helping a consumer with getting their specific assistive technology. A lot of this is speaking to the fire, but um, it's important to realize that each TBI is different. Many of the symptoms that we went over today, is a most people have a cross-section of different, um, one of those uh, symptoms, and so it's important to determine what the uh, what the area of concern is, as well as what strengths and abilities that that consumer has to that concern, as um, and so 
uh, and to remember that if someone has, for instance, a physical um, concern, but they also have things with memory, that you're not just working with isolated symptoms, but you're navigating a cluster of symptoms simultaneously. So it's really important to keep the holistic um, perspective in mind when working with folks with TBI. Um, so this is to Doug, uh, and he will be going over to, to discuss services um, for California. Thank you, Crystal. I appreciate the information that you gave out there. And uh, I want to now talk a little bit about the Traumatic Brain Injury Services of California. Um, Traumatic Brain Injury Services of California, or TAVISCA, um, is a group of people that provide services um, under Department of Rehabilitation. They've recently moved from Department of Mental Health to Department of Rehabilitation. Um, first, I wanted to find out if there's anyone on that are members of Tabisca. Um, if so, can you please write in the chat, chat box uh, and identify yourself? I wasn't sure if we had any Tabisca members on or not. I saw somebody that was from a brain injury um, place. Um, so I wanted to let you know that actually Jorge from Cecil is part of the Tabisco organization because Cecil, where we work, uh, is one of the seven TBI service sites in California. Um, I want to recognize Linda Eaton. Uh, she is one of the Tabisco members and um, her PowerPoint was very helpful in uh, creating some of the slides that we created for this PowerPoint. So uh, thank you, Linda, wherever you are. Uh, she said that she would hope to be able to be on this today, but she had a conflicting schedule. So I was hoping she might be able to make it, but I don't think she will. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the core services. Um, Oh, there was a request from Outreach and Services for Consumers with Brain Injury to type in your name so that we can know uh, who is from that organization. Uh, okay, so let me go on. Um, the core services of the Tabisca sites are information, referral, and coordination. Um, as you'll notice, that's that are similar to uh, one of the core services of your uh, Centers for Independent Living as well as your information and referral, uh, community reintegration, supported living, vocational supportive services, uh, public and professional education. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the intersection between the um, services provided by the Tabisco service sites and those provided um, by the AT Network and Centers for Independent Living. Um, both Centers for Independent Living and uh, the service sites operate under the Department of Rehabilitation. Um, they both have an emphasis on uh, providing uh, appropriate information and referral. Um, community outreach is an important part of both your Centers for Independent Living and your TBI service sites. So that may present an opportunity for uh, some overlap and collaboration. Uh, both are involved in doing um, uh, public and professional education, uh, letting people know about what kinds of services are out there. Oh, somebody asked the name of the person who helped with the PowerPoint. Uh, yes, her name is Linda Eaton, and she is 
from one of the TBI service sites. Um, Linda Eaton is from uh, Mercy uh, General Hospital, which is in the Sacramento area. Thank you, Crystal. So let me move on to the next one. Um, collaborating with TBI service sites. TBI service sites um, are a good resource for consumers, so you may be able to collaborate by um, doing, uh, finding out who the no nearest TBI service site is in your area um, and um, sharing resources for people with TBI. Uh, and opportunity as well to share expertise. Uh, you all have a lot of expertise in the area of AT, and uh, so you may be able to do outreach and cross-referral, um, but you might be able to uh, do education about AT to one of the TBI service sites in your area, um, and you may encourage the service site to come to your organization. and. Uh, since they do outreach, make a presentation about um, TBI to your organization. Another possibility is to do a joint presentation um, out in the community where um, they are talking about TBI in general and you can talk about uh, AT for TBI as well as AT for a variety of other disabilities. Um, so these are some of the ways that um, there may be some overlap and as well as some opportunities for being able to work together with the TBI service site in your area. I want to show you where the TBI service sites are. Uh, first of all, there are only seven of them in California. Uh, there's been work in the past to try to increase the number of service sites, but due to funding being limited to the, a small portion of the seatbelt fund, unfortunately two things have happened. One is the seatbelt fund has actually been shrinking rather than growing because of the fact that um, more people are using their seatbelts, which is a good thing. However, uh, it did it's, it's a limited source of funding. Um, so uh, the one for Los Angeles County is the Betty Clooney Foundation. Um, the one for um, our area, which is Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Benito counties, is the Central Coast Center for Independent Living, uh, a new option program. There's the Janet Pomeroy Center in San Francisco, which is coordinated with the TBI network. Uh, and that covers San Francisco County. I believe it also covers San Mateo County. Uh, Making Headway Center is in Humboldt, Mendocino, and Del Norte counties. Um, so it actually is the one that covers the largest geographic area. Mercy General Hospital uh, is in Sacramento, Placer, and El Dorado counties. Options Family of Services is in San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties. And then St. Jude Medical Center is at St. Jude Brain Injury Network in Orange County, California. So we wanted to let you know what these resources are and where they are available because uh, we want you to be able to have an opportunity to work together. Um, we've done some other we webinars throughout California and they have uh, played an integral part of them uh, and are a great resource. I wanted to next mention some additional resources. One is a website that we have created called California um, for California TBI Awareness and it's called uh, 
it's for stands for California TBI, or it's called CATB, C A T B I dot org. There's the um, TBI Services of California, which talks about the seven Tabisca sites, and that's uh, www.tbisca.org. There's the Defense and Veteran Brain Injury Center, uh, www.dvbic.org. Uh, they have a lot of information about veterans and brain injury. Um, brain injury, as I said, is very significant amongst your veterans. Uh, it's uh, a lot more significant in the current wars because of the impact of the blasts. Uh, there's the Brain Injury Association of America, or www.biausa.org. Brain Injury Association of California, or www.biacal.org and BrainLine, or www.brainline.org. These are some excellent resources, and I encourage you to take a look at them and see what is available on these sites. So that concludes our presentation. Uh, are there any questions or comments that anybody would like to make at this time? And I'll go ahead and open up the floor. Okay, there is a question from, um, I believe it's from Empower Tech. Um, how, to, how to discriminate between mental illness and TBI? Um, perhaps um, you can clarify that if, if it's a question. Or Doug, maybe you know, or Crystal. Uh, sure, I can talk a little bit about the differences between mental illness and TBI. The main, first let me say that uh, you can have psychiatric disabilities along with um, traumatic brain injury. Many of the veterans that are returning have PTSD as well as um, a traumatic brain injury. And so there's certain things that overlap and certain things that are different. Um, and um, so you kind of want to look at the symptoms. I would say that the headaches are pretty unique to uh, TBI as opposed to um, having um, having uh, PTSD. Uh, and I mentioned veterans, but also other people have uh, PTSD. An accident uh, can be a very uh, life-changing thing. It can be uh, from a gunshot. You could have been attacked. It could be from a variety of sources. They can also be as uh, impactful to the individual as um, being a veteran. So um, I would say that you, you look at the combination of the symptoms and those uh, that that do or don't overlap. Again, um, I don't want to say that we're in the business of doing diagnosis. Uh, you want to look for what the person might actually be experiencing, but it's your um, neuropsychologists um, that are the ones that are really the experts at being able to diagnose whether or not somebody has uh, a traumatic brain injury. So you just want to, I would suggest looking for the signs and symptoms uh, and uh, then to actually have it uh, be diagnosed, you'd want to go to a professional that's involved in doing that. Um, were there any other questions, Crystal? <coughs> 